Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, Black Hat session about uh, rediscovering HeadCrab. We're going to take you through a fascinating story of how we found this sophisticated malware and how we were able to find unique uh, technical capabilities that it had. And we're going to unveil for the first time here in Black Hat the conversation that we were able to make with the attacker, uh, revealing uh, additional insights into the attacks uh, that he performed. We're going to do a quick uh, Redis introduction, so you all uh, know what we're talking about. Then we're going to uh, talk about how we discovered the uh, headcrab malware, along with why we gave that malware that name. Uh, we're going to then go over the technical analysis of the malware and its uh, C2 infrastructure, along with how we were able to find victims of the malware across the globe. Then we're going to get to the really juicy part where we talk about the attacker conversation, which we were able to have, and uh, what, what are the insights that we were able to discover from that. Uh, in the last two sessions, two uh, uh, parts, we're going to talk about uh, two new uh, tools that were used by attacker uh, for the first time, again, unveiling that in uh, Black Hat here. Uh, and we're going to go through the technical analysis of that. But first, a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we're both part of uh, Aqua Nautilus, Aqua Security Research Team. Uh, Aqua Security is a cloud-native uh, security company, which obviously targets the cloud, so most of it is Linux-based, and we're more co focused on uh, Linux. Uh, our research team uh, mainly does vulnerability research, threat research, malware analysis, and open source tool development, like Tracy, the one tool that we're going to present uh, uh, soon. So a little bit about ourselves. Uh, I'm uh, Asaf Eitani. I'm a senior security researcher at Aqua, and uh, I'm more focused on the low-level side uh, and the malware analysis side. And in the past, I've done some incident response. And with me is Nitsan Yaakov. Hello, everyone. I'm Nitsan Yaakov. I'm security data analyst at Aqua Security. As part of my work, I do threat research and data analysis in order to detect new attacks in the wild and investigate them. One of the tools in which we use to uh, find and detect this information is the honeypot. A honeypot is a common technique in which we use to uh, trap those attackers by using a misconfigured or vulnerable application. We attract them to implement their attacks on them and then able to gather the information and further investigate. First, it helps us to detect new methods and tools used by the attackers, which provide us information about immediate threats, such as new malware. It also provides us indication of malicious indicators associated with the attacker, such as IP addresses, domains, and hashes. It also provides us deeper understanding on the threat landscape, focusing on attacker TTPs, which allowing us to see the bigger picture. During our analysis process, we are using Aqua's open source solution, Tracy. Tracy is a runtime eBPF threat detection engine, which monitors uh, events on the machine. Here you can see an example of a honeypot environment. As you can see, there are applications spreader, uh, and on, which, on each one of them, Tracy is installed. Tracy is able to record the attack and identify the action performed by those attackers that later on analyzed by our team. As you can see, one of the applications is Redis, and today we will focus on Redis. So what is Redis? Redis is a popular database solution. It supports master-slave cluster application, which means that the master and slave can transfer data between one another. Uh, in order to decrease security issues, Redis added a new feature called protective mode. It's designed to prevent from Redis instances accepting connection from external hosts. But in case this feature is disabled, Redis uh, can be accessed anonymously, which can lead for an attacker to execute commands on the instance. Redis also boosts unique capabilities, such as Redis modules, which extends the server functionality. We mentioned Redis modules, and Redis modules are shared objects, uh, which using uh, dynamic loaders, which rapidly implementing Redis commands with Redis feature, uh, and it's similar to what can be done inside the core itself. Redis can be loaded. Redis model, sorry, can be loaded into Redis at startup by using the Redis configuration file, or at runtime by using the Redis command module load. 
Once Redis module is loaded, it's considered part of the Redis process itself and has access to all of its uh, resources. So we took a glimpse and uh, saw what is Redis. And on 2018, a security researcher found a technique in which he able to abuse the slave of or replica of feature. Slave of and replica of are common commands in Redis. Replica of uh, can be found in your versions of Redis. And he talked about it in a conference called Zero Nights. And now let's see how the attacker used this technique in order to infect our Redis server. As you can see, we have here the victim server in blue. And it consists the Redis process and the Redis uh, server in red. The attacker scans the internet, identifies our uh, Redis server, connects to it anonymously, and gains the ability to execute commands on it. He decided to turn our server into a slave and ex execute the slave of command and specify the IP address of the master. Our ready server becomes a replica of the master and starts synchronizing with it, expecting to receive data from it. However, in our scenario, our master server is malicious and it sends malicious Redis module disguised as a data file. You can see that it sends the headcrab shared object file. And this file is saved to the disk in the temp directory. And if you take a closer look, you will be able to see that the name of the module uh, consists from the timestamp from the synchronization process. We will talk about it on the next slide. Then the attacker is able to load the module by using the command module load. And at the end, he loaded this uh, file, and it considered part of the Redis process and has access to all of its resources. We saw how the infection process works. And now let's take a look how the attack looks from the pickup file. So we have the time Redis command that the attacker initiated, and he receives a time check. Then he executes the slave of attack, as we mentioned, and receives OK. Then once again, the attacker initiates the time Redis command and receives the time check after turning our server into a slave, which means that by now the attacker receives time range that consists inside it the slave of attack that he just initiated. We mentioned that our Redis model is malicious, and it sends malicious Redis model disguised as a data file. The model name corresponds with the timestamp from the synchronization process, and the attacker used this fact. And you can see that he tried to load many uh, uh, modules uh, and uses the timestamp from the synchronization process to brute force its loading. But at the end, only one model uh, successfully loads. Now the attacker has actually received the ability of RCE, which means that he is able to execute commands on our machine. And he uses it. As you can see, he executes the ID command and receives information from our machine. So we saw that the attacker was able to load uh, the malware. And now let's get familiar with the malware itself. For those who are not familiar with a computer game Half-Life like me, don't panic. This is not a roasted chicken. I've checked, so you can be uh, sure about it. Uh, so we mentioned the computer game Half-Life. And in this uh, game, Headcrab is recognized. And there is a monster which attacks humans and turns them to zombies. And this is essentially what the attacker performed in his attack. He targeted our host, infected it with the malware, and then spread through the network in order to attack others. You might be wondering why we decided to call this malware headcrop. Uh, but what the truth is, we didn't. During our investigation, we came across this mini blog that the attacker had compiled along with the malware. And there you can see that he introduced this tool as headcrab, and that's how we decided about this name. He also mentioned his motivation. Uh, as you can see, he performs mining activities. So this is all done for financial gain. He also leave a note with an email address and encourage those who find this mini block to write to him. And if you take a closer look, you will be able to see that his name is Ice9J. So please remember this line. We will get into this later on. 
we also able to understand, uh, assume actually, when the attacker is actually started to act. And we can see that he started to write this mini blog in September 2021. So we assume that this is when he started to initiate his attacks. And now brace yourself because we are going to unveil the cherry on top. What was most intriguing about this mini blog was when we came across this line when the attacker took the trouble to mentioning us, Aqua Security. It occurred as a reply to a blog we had published in December 2022. Uh, and it was an amazing reveal to find out, as we know that the attacker is actually reading our blogs. And it got us really excited to get and investigate the malware more and get familiar with the attacker. Thank you, Nitsan. So uh, now let's take a look at the technical analysis of the malware. We've seen uh, that it has a unique mini blog, but let's see what other things are unique about it. First of all, Headcrab makes usage of the custom Redis commands, which is a feature of Redis, in order to uh, establish its C2 communication channel. Uh, the second thing is the high operation security in, uh, implemented inside the malware. Basically, this is the, the cherry on top of the, of the malware, and we're going to see examples for that later on. Uh, in addition to that, we have another 50 uh, plus advanced uh, capabilities, uh, which is really unique. We, usually when we, we see malwares that uh, support command execution and file dropping, but here we have over 50 capabilities ranging all the way from do dropping a file in command execution, all the way to uh, loading a fileless kernel module. In order to see the technical analysis, uh, we're going to go through the attack phases. We're going to start uh, in the infection, then the CTU channel, uh, defense evasion, persistence D, and lateral movement. Uh, the infection part, we actually already covered. This is the slave of uh, attack that uh, Nitsan mentioned before. Let's see it, uh, the things about the C2 channel. As I mentioned, uh, the C2 channel is based on the Redis commands, on, on custom Redis commands, which is a feature that enables uh, Redis modules to uh, write their own commands. As you can see, the attacker uh, wrote uh, several commands in the format of uh, RDS and another character, and is using that in order to communicate with the malware and get uh, uh, the re return, uh, return value as we've seen with the RDSS. And also, uh, in the bottom screen, you can see uh, the RDSR command being used in order to communicate with an encrypted way with the operator. The next stage is the defense evasion. Uh, and here we have another example to the usage of uh, Headcrab with Redis. Uh, basically, Headcrab overwrites default Redis commands in order to hide itself from being detected. For example, the fourth line, the monitor command, is used in Redis in order to display the commands that were executed on that server. Uh, basically, by overwriting this uh, command to the invalid command specified in the bottom side of the screen, uh, the attacker basically disables these commands, and users cannot uh, find this, uh, this command or use it. What's interesting uh, about this as well is the, um, the attacker decides to overwrite the two functions that uh, used to in order to infiltrate the server in the first place, the slave of and the replica of, which is really weird because this is his, uh, uh, this is his infection channel. But when you think about it, it makes sense because he doesn't want other attackers to infect the server as well. So he overwrites this command to prevent this attack from occurring again. Let's get back to our attack graph. It's going to accompany us through the session. Uh, so now we talked about the overriding of commands and registration of uh, custom commands. And the RDS commands are used in order to control the malware. And as Nitsan mentioned, we've seen in our honeypot also the activity of crypto mining. And this is what the attacker is doing, is giving the commands to run a crypto mining, uh, dropping the crypto miner if into MemFD. What is MF MemFD? MemFD is a uh, part of uh, several uh, file systems in uh, Linux, which are uh, memory-backed uh, file systems. This means that uh, the attacker is able to use the file as it's a real file, but it's not get saved into the disk. Uh, MemFD and DevSHM are both uh, that type of uh, file systems. Uh, the TMP directory, I'm sure that you all know of, uh, it gets uh, overridden with a restart, and also some disk scanning tools are, uh, are skipping this uh, directory. And 
At last, we have the network buffer, which is a, a way of a head crab to load payloads from the communication channel directly into the memory, either of the process of, or of the kernel, like we've uh, said before, the fileless kernel module loading. So basically, head crab is doing all of that in order to avoid saving files on disks, and uh, by that, avoiding antiviruses or disk scanning tools, uh, which try to find it. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the operation security and see what unique capabilities Headcrab has that other malware don't have. So the first thing is shell history hiding. Whenever Headcrab executes a command, he accompanies it by the environment variable hist file equals dev null. This basically makes it so the commands that Headcrab executes are not saved into the history file and cannot be investigated later on by the defender. The second uh, uh, ability is uh, log clearing. And usually we're seeing that in the form of uh, log deletion. But here, Headcrab is doing something unique. Instead of deleting the logs, he's truncating them to size zero, basically telling the operation system that the maximum size would be zero, effectively clearing the files and not triggering an alert like other uh, malwares will do when they uh, delete the files. Another example is uh, the usage of attributes instead of files to hide data. So we mentioned that he's tried to avoid creating files on disk. And uh, uh, this is another example. He wants to save his configuration, but he doesn't want to create a, a, a file. So he's using attributes in order to save the data and be used later. Attributes are a feature of the file, uh, file system in Linux. Then we have the Lua script execution. Uh, which uh, uh, is in this uh, uh, ability, Headcrab is able to receive a little script into memory and uh, save it into memfd and execute it, basically enabling uh, a tight control over the memory as uh, uh, Lua is a script language which has a really uh, tight control over memory structures. Another example is the usage of the dynamic loader as a living off di the land binary in order to execute uh, malwares and avoid whitelist solutions or uh, security mechanisms that uh, try to find execution of new binaries. He's doing that by executing the dynamic loader with the argument uh, of the path he wants to load. This basically creates a process, but with the name of the dynamic loader, so any uh, uh, whitelisting solution would fail to detect that attack. The next ability is uh, file time stomping, which is a technique used by a, a headcrab in any files that he is, he is able to uh, affect or modify. He's basically modifying the, the time, the access time, and the, the modification time back to normal uh, to make the, the file look benign and not be detected. Then we have the environment awareness of Headcrab. This is also something very unique. Uh, we see Headcrab is using iNotify system, which is a feature of, uh, in Linux, which is able to uh, alert the one that's using it if any file that was registered is being accessed or uh, written or reader, readed. And, uh, and Headcrab is using that on the proc stat path and the dev PTS path both for uh, uh, different reasons. For the first one is if anybody tried to find his cryptocurrency attempt and tries to run top to see which process is taking uh, a lot of CPU, uh, that will alert the attacker and he will stop the mining process. The second one, the dev PTS, is a file that's been created when somebody interactively logs into the machine. So if you log into the machine with SSH, the attacker is able to know that and stop his mining activities to avoid being detected. The last uh, defense evasion uh, technique we're going to talk about is uh, also related to the persistency. And uh, what Edcrop is doing here is he planting a persistency uh, in the Redis configuration in order to uh, make the module uh, uh, survive a reboot. But it's not just modifying the, the Redis configuration. is adding the line and attaching a lot of spaces before and after in order for uh, defenders that try to investigate the file not to see this added command. Uh, this is how it looks like. I know that you can't read it, don't worry. But uh, you can notice that on the left side of the screen, we have a lot of text. This is the original configuration. And on the right side of the screen, 
we have the, the added text. So if you look at it at, uh, let's say, VI, Vim, Nano, or Cat, you won't be able to see it. Now let's uh, see some of uh, the attacker's persistency techniques. So as Asaf mentioned, the attacker uh, do use with a module autoloading technique. The attacker also mentioning that he created a credential stealing uh, service, which does use with the in a D script as the restart script. And we will show you this in, in a few slides, so stay tuned. The attacker also possessed lateral movement capabilities. And during our investigation, we revealed that we came across the server that attacked us, and we started to investigate its IP address. And we found that this uh, IP address belonged to a security company. And we thought, how weird is that? So we decided to dig a little bit deeper, and we uh, revealed that the attacker initially attacked this server, turning it into an attacking server uh, in order to attack other, us included. So you can see here on the map that the attacker attacking servers worldwide, turning them into an uh, attacking server using his pivoting and tunneling uh, capabilities, and basically creates a botnet, which makes it even harder to find its origin. Let's do a bit recap of what we just saw by now. So we talked about the infection method, how the attacker is abusing the slave of a replica of a feature in order to infect our ready server. Then we continued to talk about the C2 channel, that the attacker creating uh, custom commands uh, in order to communicate with the malware. Then we show you multiple defensive agent techniques, and this is the highlight of Headcrab. We continue to see some of uh, his persistency techniques, and lastly, we talked about his lateral movement capabilities, and we saw how widespread the attack actually is. So it got us to think how many Redis instances were infected due to this attack and had become attacking servers. We started to think of a unique method in which we will be able to detect those infections in the Redis instances. And since we know that the attacker created custom commands in order to perform actions on Redis servers, we decided to use the common Redis command command, which replies all the commands that are available to the server to uh, process. Since we know that the attacker uh, is creating the custom command and these commands will appear on the ready server, it will be easy for us to detect the server as infected. You can see here an illustration of an infected ready server. You can see that at the beginning, we executed the command command in order to receive all the commands that are available on the server. At the beginning, you can see the default commands like uh, slave of and time. And at the end, you can see that it prints the custom command like RDSS, RDSR, etc., which indicates that the server was infected. We took this method and scanned the internet in order to find misconfigured ready servers. And we revealed that 1,200 servers were infected due to this attack. And you can see that they are all spread worldwide. The attacker is not targeting specific region or specific uh, country, which emphasizes our assumption that his goal is basically financial gain. Uh, during our investigation, we revealed that some of the server uh, belongs to different companies, and we informed them that they were infected. So by now we saw some of the attacker's techniques, and now let's get familiar with the attacker himself. Not long ago, we mentioned that the attacker has left an email address, remember? We couldn't forget about it either, and we decided to write to him and test our human abilities. And surprisingly, the attacker is actually answered us. And on our first conversation with him, the attacker mentioned that we were the first one to write to him. And it was surprising to us, as we know that the attacker started to attack in September 2021, and we discovered about the attack a uh, year and a half later which means there is a long period of time, and we understand that we might be the first one to discover about this attack. The second thing that we tried to ask the attacker, what, what was his name? And the answer that his name is Ice9, like in the email, Ice9J, or other strings that we've seen in the malware. Uh, which got us to, sing, to think and uh, to search the internet, what is Ice9? And we came across this song.
So this is Ice Nine by Joe Satriani, a famous guitar player. Uh, so if you will, Ice Nine J, maybe. Um, but when we dug a little bit deeper, we found the following reference from a fan-based Wikipedia page about the person of interest TV series in which Ice9 or Ice9.exe is a virus uh, labeled the world's most lethal virus. We, you can uh, imagine how shocked uh, were we and uh, how we responded. That's a virus. My God. Ice9. Outage is global as it stretched into its second day. Financial markets plunged, sending the world's economy into turmoil. The catastrophic malware dubbed the ICE-9 virus by security experts continues to proliferate as systems across the world are experiencing its effects. Okay, okay, so uh, the attacker is not taking over the world just yet, but he's trying to one ready server at a time. Uh, during our conversation with him, we also wanted to know if the attacker is identified with some uh, known attacking group like Team TNT, and we decided to mention them. The attacker revealed some interesting information about them. According to him, Team TNT used the same credential for the user in all of their hacked system, which means that making it easy for him to uh, found those uh, uh, server by using his SSH credential stealer tool and take control over them. This is a brilliant move by the attacker as he able to take control over those systems and use it for his own good. The attacker also mentioning that he developed a new mod that he called semi fileless uh, and he's mentioning that he preventing uh, saving files on disk can only allow it before reboot or power off when process ID is equal to one. And this is exactly like getting on a train before it leaves the station. The attacker is able to leave a mark on the compromised machine and getting back to it without being discovered. The attacker also mentioning that he is not targeting Redis in particular, but he's also targeting Postgres, SSH, Nginx, and even Docker, which emphasize how widespread the attack is. Funny or not, but even our attacker follows some rules, and he sent us this list of rules that he follows. So on the first rule, we can see that the attacker concerns from the high performance rates on the compromised machine, but he's actually just worrying that his mining activity will be discovered as it increases the performance rates. On the second rule, the attacker says that he strives to uh, eliminate competitors in order to maintain control of the compromised machine, and he does so by terminating previous campaigns. The last rule, we talked about it at the technical analysis part, the attacker closing the back door by removing the slave of a replica of commands, and by that assure from future infections to appear on our machine. By now we understand that the attacker is trying to conceal himself and hide his mining activity, and he mentioned that he uses iNotify in order to do so. In case someone connects to the machine, he stops the mining activity, and by that access, able to stay out of radar. By now, you probably understand how our relationship with the attacker had tightened, and it felt like it was the right time to send us a present. How lucky are we, right? So he decided to send us his SSH credential stealer tool, which can steal credential from different services, along with detailed instruction on how to use it. Uh, and he also sent us a screenshot with an example of the tool uh, in production, as you can see here. And now, let's present you the tool. Thank you, Nitsan. So as you can see, we were able to uh, communicate with the attacker and have some additional insights, which is, ama is amazing uh, feat. And uh, let's see what's so special about this tool. So again, for those of you who played Half-Life games, you probably recognize this character. This is G-Man. Uh, but uh, don't be fooled. This is not a screenshot from the game. This is a screenshot actually from our debugger attached to the service. The first thing that the service is doing is uh, it detects that it's being debugged, prints this ASCII art, and then terminates the uh, debugger. The second thing is the usage of FA Notify, which is a system uh, of Linux, not to be mixed with iNotify, uh, in order to prevent access to malicious files that he creates. Uh, FA Notify is able to um, let the attacker control requests to files, and by that, he just simply declines any requests uh, that are not his own. Then the service is using uh, hooks in order to steal credentials. And he first uses a, a known 
uh, and uh, pretty much uh, all figured out techniques like ptrace, uh, which is easy to detect and easy to block. But if that doesn't work, he goes into more and more complex uh, techniques, all the way up to uh, direct memory uh, manipulation by m manipulating the proc mem file. As we said, he wants to, uh, to steal credentials, so he hooks the authentication and connection functions uh, of SSHD, FTPD, MailD, and he also has some references to SQLD, uh, but they are not uh, integrated yet, so maybe we'll see them in a later on version. The next thing that the attacker is doing, uh, the service is doing, is he re-injects the original headcrop.so malware into the Redis server. He's doing that by scanning the localhost for any Redis ports, connecting to them, and re-injecting them using the module load. This is important because it tells us that this uh, service and the malware is tightly connected, and they need to uh, coexist in the same machine uh, to back each other's back. Another example to that is the similarity between the two. And as you can see, uh, Edgrub and the service are uh, similar in 87% uh, in the functions. Basically, the service contains all the functionality of Edgrub. So let's get back to our attack graph. I know that you missed it. So the first thing, uh, uh, we saw everything on that board. And now we know that the service is being added. So uh, we see a drop and install of the service. Also, if you can notice, it's named ICE9J which hooks the legitimate uh, services, trying to steal the credentials, and uses FA, in, FA Notify in order to block any request to the files. And as we mentioned, a re-injection of the Edcrab SO back to the server. OK, so we thought that we were done. OK, this is a complex attack. It's, so, uh, it's super cool. But several months later, um, we found Edcrab 2.0. Uh, let's see what, uh, what has changed. And of course, the first thing that we're going to check is the mini blog. So first of all, Headcrab uh, uh, again puts a reference to our blog, uh, to, our, to Aqua Security, and uh, compliments our, on, our, on our content. Then he talks about uh, that we didn't mention the Lua and iNotify systems, and asks if we can catch his service. Of course we can, but we don't need to because he already sent it to us. The second thing that he is doing is attaching a YouTube video uh, saying thanks for the motivational video, and that really surprised us. Uh, so when we uh, entered it, we saw that this is a video done on our blog by Daniel Lowry on his weekly CTI series. So again, we see another interaction of the attacker with uh, security researchers. Then on April, we'll see a, a, another message related to the technical details. So custom commands are gone with the wind, as are most of Tracy alerts. This is really important. We're going to get to the uh, custom commands in a bit and see how it affects us. But also, we can see that there's another reference to us, uh, Aqua Security, uh, on our tool, uh, Tracy, and he's actively trying to avoid our, tr our tool. And he's testing his tools on our tool. I can assure you that he's not able to, uh, to escape them, because we have our own proprietary signatures that he doesn't have access to. He has some plans to the future, and he's trying to reference Daniel again, uh, talking about how his uh, actions are legitimate. And uh, of course, you can understand this is all uh, excuses for illegal activity. Let's take a look at the technical uh, side. So first of all, we've seen in the first version the overwriting of commands. But now we see something a little bit uh, more complex. Uh, is using the Redis infrastructure itself. This is an example for the Redis command structure uh, in order to hook the commands uh, that he wants to uh, override or change. Uh, he's modifying the Redis command proc, and you can see that in the screen uh, above, uh, in front of you, uh, where he modifies the function pointer to the actual, actual function that will be executed on that command. This is essentially making Headcrop 2.0 the first Redis rootkit uh, that was ever discovered, and he's using that in order to edit uh, requests and return of the, of the malware. OK, so the second thing that we want to talk about is the new C2 channel. So we mentioned that the custom commands are gone with the wind, so how we communicate with the malware now is using it by the mget command, which is a default command. Uh, in front of you is a normal usage, so we when you normally use uh, mget, 
you ask for a key and you get a value. In this instance, black at Europe, and we get rediscovering headcrab. But the attacker, it looks something a little bit different. First of all, we see that uh, the attacker is specifying a string to identify itself as the attacker. Then an encryption key is being sent and is used in the encryption key exchange in order to establish an uh, encrypted C2 communication. And this is how the command and control of the EdgeCrop 2.0 is being performed. OK, so I know you all missed it. Let's get back to the attack graph. I, I assure you this is the last time you're going to see it. Um, you can notice that this attack graph is a little bit different. Uh, so we've seen that uh, the rogue server doesn't send the head crop, it sends the loader SO, which is dropped into the temp directory and loaded. And then, just then, head crop is being say, sent to the loader, being saved into memfd, and loaded. This is again done by, by the attacker to avoid creating his files on disk and avoid by being scanned by antivirus uh, or disk scanning solutions. Then everything is pretty much the same, overriding of commands, a usage of the mget command in order to execute this crypto miner, and of course, the service with all of his uh, actions is being performed. If you want to take a screenshot, this is, this is now because uh, that's the full graph. OK, so we wanted to find victims of uh, the new version. But as we mentioned, uh, custom commands are gone with the wind, so we don't have that to rely on. And also, because he is sort of a, a rootkit, uh, the original command is being executed if we are not identified as the attacker, and the string uh, that the attacker is identified by is changed from instance to instance. So what do we do? Let's try to look at the logic of uh, the command hook and try to find the bug. So this is a pseudocode of the, of the command. And you can notice that if you uh, execute the command properly, you always get an OK. So if you try to rewrite or set the dir or db file name uh, uh, key, you'll get uh, an instant OK, no matter what. So we thought to ourselves, oh, OK, this is an uh, interesting idea. Let's try to change the dir key to a non-existent path across the world, like a random hash, and see which servers return an OK. And this is an example of how this is done. So this is a clean server, as you can see. We just uh, try something random, and we got an error. And in the infected server, we tried to change it to something random and got an instant OK. This led us to uh, the discovery of another 1,100 uh, new servers that are being uh, infected, that are infected by Headcrop 2.0. Uh, again, spread across the world uh, and totaling at 3,300 victims. So this was a long session, a long and technical session. Let's see our conclusions. First of all, Headcrop is a sophisticated uh, attacker that has a deep understanding of the Redis uh, framework and used it, and used it to fit in with the normal behavior of the Redis server in order to stay hidden. We were able to interact with the Redis team after we published our first blog and present them uh, the attack in order to find uh, ways we can prevent those kind of attacks from occurring uh, in newer versions. We also were able to, uh, to find issues in the malware in order to detect victims, as we've seen in both cases. And two tips uh, just before we, uh, we part. If you're using ready servers, use protected mode. And Tracy, like other runtime solutions, can help you detect those advanced threats. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nitsan. Thank you, Asaf. And here we have uh, <laughs> Thank you. On the screen, you have a, a QR code of our social media and a blog and blog post, along with the, uh, with the direct link to our uh, previous blog post. We're going to publish another blog about the newer version. I think we have uh, time for a question or two. If someone wants to come to the microphone, either here or there. You can be brave. It's not scary. <laughs> OK, uh, we're going to be outside in the hallway uh, if anybody wants to approach and uh, ask something. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for listening. Thank you.